we're going to do a look at the entire Course in Miracles over the course of the next three years. It's going to take us that long to do it. Just doing one Sunday afternoon a month, uh, skipping uh, August of each year as using that for vacation time. Okay, good. I did a little outline for you of what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the 50 Miracles Principles, which is the first part of the Course in Miracles. But before that, I'd like to do a little bit more of a kind of a talk about how the Course came into existence and a little bit about, about what it says and, and that sort of thing. As you all know, it was scribed by Dr. Helen Schuchman, the research psychologist professor at Columbia, of the physicians and surgeons here in New York City. Helen, in some ways, was a very unlikely candidate, uh, and in some ways, very resistant to this whole idea. Uh, but at the same time, that's true. She was very highly intuitive and very um, visionary, and um, <clears throat> got really into a dynamic relationship. I think, as, as a young uh, woman, she was uh, sort of thought of herself as being an atheist, but. I had an exchange with Ken Wapnick this week on emails he just written, he just finished reading the next book I've written, and uh, he, he wrote back and he says, you know Helen was no atheist. <laughs> and I said, Helen was no atheist, I said, that's really what really she wasn't. She just flirted with atheism. She, anybody that got into that kind of a relationship with God is not, a, not an atheist. Right? Um, the way the Course came, is not the way we have it in the beginning of the book. The first thing that, that happened was actually the first part that we're going to look at today. This is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. And then it started with the first of the 50 Miracles Principles. Um, the Course changes as you move through it, becoming more and more really kind of beautiful and poetic as you go along. Um, the, the roughest part of the course is really the first four or five chapters. By the roughest, I mean the roughest in terms of it's, it's kind of awkward in places. It doesn't have this kind of poetry that it has. The last several chapters are all, all in I am in pentameter. What really happened was that as Helen progressed in this, she just became more and more of a channel, more and more clearly receptive to the entire workbook. Nothing was ever changed in the workbook. When the, first, when the course first started, it had a lot to do about Bill and Helen's relationship. So there was a lot of that in the original of what's called the Urtext. So the way this happened was that Helen wrote the course down in shorthand. She actually knew more than one different kind of shorthand, so she actually mixed up different kinds of shorthand. Plus she had her own version of shorthand that she sort of would make words that you know, that meant of, right? It's the dash or something, right? So, <clears throat> she would then read it to Bill. Bill would type up what she had read. She wrote these little steno books, and she would write it sitting in the back of a cab, um, get up in the middle of the night, take stuff down, just whenever. But she could also just stop mid-sentence and go answer the phone and come back and pick right up where she had left off, and nothing would really change. But there was a really a lot of stuff in the beginning about their relationship. Um, there was stuff about Freud and Jung and Rom and a lot about Edgar Casey, etc. And they were really guided to take all of that information out of the beginning of the course because it wasn't really relevant to the whole meaning of the course. Uh, so that original edition is called the Urtext. And you can get the Urtext online if you want to. Uh, some people got really excited when they realized that the Urtext existed, and it's, so they got it published. It doesn't really change in any way, I don't think, the, the message of the Course. Um, they were actually guided by Jesus to, to go back and say, you don't, we don't need to be talking about your relationship here in the beginning of this, or Freud, or Young, or Edgar Casey, etc. Uh, after chapter four and five, by the time we get to six, it's really very smooth and very, very clear. I think you'll see that as we go through it. Uh, actually, in the beginning, uh, Helen would show the course to very, very few people. 
And uh, when she did, she would not show them the beginning part. Uh, she would show them the, the more beautiful latter parts of the course uh, initially. So that's just a little bit about the evolution. Helen typed it twice after the first time that Bill typed it. Um, that was the first edition that uh, Ken Wapnick saw. And then Ken uh, went through it. Ken and Helen together went through literally sentence by sentence, kind of asking, is this what you want? And so we get what we call the, what became the first edition of The Course in Miracles. And um, that was published on June 22nd, 1976. Uh, I think I told you last time it's now about uh, 2.5 million in sales in English and uh, another half a million in sales in, it's in about 22 languages now. There's four or five different translations that are going on at the present time, so it's really a great portion of the world to read the course if they wanted to. Uh, originally, there were not uh, 50 Miracles Principles, there were more than 50. Uh, Ken said that when he first saw it, there were 53. <coughs> but um, Bill Thetford, who was Helen's uh, companion in the writing of the course, it would be nice if there were 50. It's just sort of a nice round number. So we'll, we'll go with 50. Uh, those other principles are not excluded. They're in there, but they're really just in their sentences that appear in chapter one uh, a little bit later on. Um, one of the things about the course is that it is an incredibly <coughs> redundant. Uh, it says the same thing over and over and over again many different times but in totally different ways. It's, and the reason for the redundancy uh, isn't just because Jesus is being repetitive, uh, it's because you and I, uh, we're pretty dense. <laughs> and we kind of need to hear things uh, over and over and over again before we begin to actually get it. One of the reasons for that is because the Course is giving us a holy, you can spell holy however you want to spell the word holy, uh, a wholly different way of seeing things, completely outside of the realms of the ego, and that's why it's so very, very different. Uh, it's also abstract, which is one of the reasons it's very difficult. We understand the concrete, um, but this is actually one of the most important points in the course, which I'll talk much more about later on. When I say abstract, we want to keep in mind that what the Course is really all about is about the mind. Actually, there's a lot of times I'm working on a book right now and, and I have a, a chapter that says the Course is all about, and I have about 20 different statements, the Course is all about this, all about this, all about this, all about this, and they're all true, right? So at one point, for example, we might be talking about forgiveness, and then at another point we may be talking about the atonement, um, and then at another point we might be talking about sin, guilt, and, and fear, but it really all kind of comes down to the same thing. As you study through the 50 Miracles Principles, you'll see that they're very, very redundant, that they are kind of saying, this. for example, number one, which we're going to look at in a minute, uh, and number 49 are most totally, I, didn't, I mean, they're, they're different words, but they're saying the same thing. Let's look, I mean, let me read number one. Right? So, <clears throat> number one says, there's no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than another. They're all the same. All expressions of love are maximum. And I lost turn to 49, which is, of course, next to the last one, the very back of the key. The miracle makes no distinction among degrees of misperception. It is a device for perception correction, effective quite apart from either the degree or the direction of the air. This is its true indiscriminateness. Now, let me say just a word before I get into the 50 principles about what a miracle is. A miracle is not some sort of phantasmagorical change in the physical world. Uh, back many years ago when I used to work as a, a Methodist minister uh, in a church up near where I live in Orange County now, uh, one of my parishioners one day said to me, I know that the Course in Miracles isn't true because I've never seen any miracles around the work that I was doing, right? 
it's not about parting Red Seas or uh, even physical kinds of healing. We're only talking about a change of mind. So the change of mind is a change of mind from looking at the world from the ego eyes or the ego perspective, which is what we do <clears throat> almost all the time. Let's just kind of admit that we're all ego addicts. Right? And seeing how we're all ego addicts, it's, and the problem is that we don't even know we're ego addicts. And if you, you got an addiction and you don't even know that you got an addiction. Another way that we could say that is that we're all dreaming and we don't know that we're dreaming. We've got this dream going, so there's some times that you probably know that you are dreaming, that you can kind of get like, this couldn't be really real. Now, I was watching a cute uh, America's Funniest Videos uh, a few weeks ago and there's a little boy sitting in the back seat of a car and somebody's got a camera on him and the little boy sitting there and this big kind of surprise on a look in his face and he goes, is this a real world? <laughs> and you know, the person, no, this is not. This is not a real world. Uh, the real world is heaven. Uh, the world, the real world is where God is. So this world is something that uh, we have split off, broken off, separated from, not a part of the kingdom of God. And in that sense, it's, it's an, an illusion, is another word that we could use. It's something that we have made up. And not only do we make it up, we continue to make it up. Uh, every culture, every society, travel a little bit, you see how it's made up in different cultures. Uh, study history a little bit, you see how it's been made up in different historical time frames. So it's just a, it's just a fantasy from that point. And so what the Course is all about, <laughs> so I could say that phrase many times, it's really about helping us to wake up. Actually, what the Course is all about, there's a third time. <laughs> it's about helping us to become more and more and more and more and more aware. So becoming increasingly aware. And what we're becoming increasingly aware of is the dream, is the fantasy, is the game, is the story, is the play that's going on. <clears throat> The problem is, is that we get caught up in the story. We get caught up in the drama and the play, and we think that these, uh, these events really are very, very real. Therefore, one of the things that you want to do as a, as a core student is learn progressively how to become more and more of an observer. So as an observer, you simply see the phenomena, you see the dynamics of the world, and you make a very simple choice. And that choice is, you're not going to play. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play this, this silly, uh, as Ken Watt makes us, uh, I'll quote Ken a lot, um, don't throw sand, don't get in the sandbox and throw, start throwing sand in. One of the ways that I've noticed, just listening to friends talking in the past few weeks, that we throw sand around a lot is uh, complaining, you know, finding problems, and, and talking about our problems to everybody we meet, you know? I mean, how much time is spent doing that, you know? You, 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 find, you, come up, you find a friend, and one of the first things that you start doing with your friend is you start going on over all your problems. Right? Well, that keeps the illusion real. That just keeps it, that just keeps it going. You're actually feeding, feeding the illusion. So what you want to do is just stop. Just stop and look. And, and see, and just don't do anything. <laughs> but I mean, just, just observe, but, but don't get involved in the, especially you don't want to be attacking back, right? You don't want to have become positional, right? I've got a piece here on the, the next column on the first page. It says, I may have mentioned this last time, I don't remember. I won't always remember what I say from time, one time to the next. Um, what is the difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person? The difference is that the unenlightened person sees a difference. <laughs> so the truth is there's no difference. There's no difference between it, but it's seeing the difference and constantly pointing out the difference that exists between us. 
that keeps this insane world, and this is an insane world. Let's be really clear about that. Most of the time, most of us, let's be really honest, we're really insane. So what the Course is all about, there's the fourth time, it's, it's about helping us to get back to sanity. Or another word that the Course uses a lot, which is a really good word, it's about helping us to get back to reasonableness. Or get back to a reasonable mind rather than an insane mind. And the reason we want to do that is because uh, an insane mind is not a happy mind. The Course is all about, there's the what, the fifth time? Okay. It's all about being happy. Lesson number 101 from the Course is God's will for me is perfect happiness. Not just any kind of happiness, not just a little bit of happiness, not just an occasional moment of joy, but perfect happiness. And perfect happiness is actually perfectly possible. Because that's the way it is in the Kingdom of Heaven. And the good news is that you are already in the Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> I may point out that there's this wonderful line in the Course where it says, everyone already knows. Everyone already knows this. Everyone already knows the truth. But we spend so much time dreaming, and we spend so much time projecting, and we spend so much time making up of the world that, that we don't remember that we already know. Unless something happens which enables you to, to remember. And there are, fortunately, these wonderful holy instances which become possible for us where for some reason in meditation or just being quiet or maybe in reading the Course or doing one of the workbook lessons or something happens where you, you do, for a moment at least, remember. And that, w when that happens, it's, we, we tend to think of it as being kind of a mystical experience. Actually, it's not a mystical experience. Actually, it is a mystical experience, but it's not a mystical experience. What I mean by that is, that it's a myst it seems like a mystical experience, but mystical experiences are actually what is natural. We're going to see here in number five in the 50 Miracles Principles, I think it is. Miracles are natural. Happiness is natural. When, it, when, when that's not what's going on, something is, something's gone wrong. So there's a lot that's gone wrong. So let's begin to look at the, at the 50 Miracles Principles. Let's look at number one. Let's spend some time on number one. <coughs> There is no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not bigger or harder, harder or bigger than another. All are the same. All expressions of love are maximum. The reason why they're all the same is because all that it is, all that a miracle is, is a change of mind. So I may change my mind about what would appear to be a small thing, something that you said that hurt me, or I may have a change of mind about what may be a big thing in terms of the way the world sees it, some kind of major injustice that we think is going on in the world, for example. In either case, it's just a change of mind. And in either case, if the mind is healed as a result of this, it doesn't make a difference again whether it's a big thing or a little thing, the mind is healed. And the mind can be healed at any time, about anything. It's really a letting, a lot of it is involves a letting go. By a letting go, I mean a letting go of our positionality. It's having a position that gets us into trouble. The, the court, there's no position, you know. I was giving a talk at uh, Unity of Chicago, and uh, I said, and this is like this room has got about 450 people in it. And I said something about, does it really make any difference if we're Republicans or Democrats? And some guy in the back row said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> the entire congregation broke up laughing for over a full minute of laughing before they, before they actually stopped. You know? <laughs> like such a thing would make a difference? No, it doesn't make any difference. 
Our politics don't make any difference. Religion doesn't make any difference. Race, you know, none of that stuff makes any difference. It's only insofar as we make it a difference that we suffer. We suffer. Huh? Because now then the word we're stuck in our minds in the idea that difference makes a difference. So let's keep in mind one of the things which makes the course in America so different. <laughs> there is a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Between Christianity and the course in America, traditional Christianity and the course in America is that the, the Course is essentially a monistic system. So it says that all there is, is God. All, all there is, is, is. <laughs> all there is, is oneness. All there is, do you know the story about Helen and, and God is? Let me tell you that story, it's a great story. Helen had these visions, right? <clears throat> so, she has this vision in which she sees herself near a seaside somewhere, like in the Middle East or something. And she, she sees a, an, a cave along in the side of the cliffs. And she goes into the cave, and in the middle of the cave, lying on a stone, is a, an old scroll, like a, a, a medieval scroll or a, an ancient scroll. And in the center of the scroll are two words. And the two words are, God is, that's all. She begins to turn the scroll to the right, and as she does, she realizes that there's like these little hieroglyphic letters or things there, but they're beginning to take shape and look like she's going to be able to read this. And she realizes that if she keeps turning it that way, she's going to be able to look into the future. And then she turns the scroll a little bit to the left, and the same thing, there's these little hieroglyphic kind of things begin to become, but she realizes that she's going to be able to read it, and she realizes that if, if she keeps turning that, she's going to be able to see into the past. Right? And for some reason, she turns it right back to where it says God is. And she hears this voice which says, thank you, you got it right this time. So it's not about looking into the past, and it's not about projecting into the future, it's just about being, uh, literally being into the present, which is, it's only in the present that we can wake up. We can't wake up in the past, after the Lord, that, that's gone, and obviously we can't be waking up in the future, uh, except in terms of time. Well, next time, in July, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about time, which is, as the Course in America says, is a uh, one of the, the vast illusion. It's a big illusion. <laughs> you know, it's one of the places that we're stuck. We're stuck in. We're stuck in time. So the course is a monistic system. Traditional Christianity is a dualistic system. Traditional Christianity certainly posits the existence of God and heaven and eternity, but at the same time, it also posits the existence of hell and a devil and. Now we got problems. Because once we have a dual, once, once we got the good bad dualism, we're, we're stuck because now we got a war. And now we got fighting between the good people and the bad people. And did you all see this thing that was on television earlier this spring, uh, winter, of uh, the <coughs> preppers, the people are getting ready for the end of the world in one way or another? And they're, building on these underground shelters and putting all this, all the food that they can get and, and everything together. And this one prepper said, he was figuring out whether he was going to shoot anybody who would come try to take his food, right? And he says, when all the good people killed all the bad people, then all there'll be is good people. There's some good ones for you, right? <laughs> and this one woman who had collected 5,000 pounds of food, 5,000 pounds of food, that she could hardly walk around their house because there's so much food source everywhere in her basement and all down the hall and everything. So says, when the world goes to hell, I'm still going to be here. <laughs> Where? <laughs> hell. <laughs> 
you're going to be in hell <laughs> when the world goes to hell. Okay. So it's the Course is just trying to help us to remember this, the truth of the identity of this oneness. Where, and this is a very, very, very important point. The very important point is oneness. There's only one of us here. There's only one mind. There's a line at the end of Lesson 52, which is a review of Lesson 10, which says, Would I not rather join my mind with the thinking of the universe? The only time that phrase appears in the entire course. The think so there's a kind of thinking, which is the thinking of the universe that we all actually share in mind. Then to continue to... Uh, Enjoy my own pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. <coughs> pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts is the dreaming of the world that we're all engaged in. We, we engage in this. And insofar as we have these pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts, these pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts keep us separated and isolated and lonely. Very lonely. That's why what the Course is all about, there's about seven times, right? so at least six. It's about joining. That's why we have the, the center for remembering and sharing. <laughs> We're both remembering and sharing. And sharing is the, the greatest joy that we have. There's a line in the Course where it says, divine abstraction, which is God, takes joy in sharing. And if you think about it, the greatest joy that we have is in sharing, isn't it? The greatest joy that there is, actually, is, is falling in love. And what happens when you fall in love? You, sh you just want to share everything. I mean, you just want to give to the, to the beloved, give to the beloved, give to the beloved, right? And <clears throat> joy is increased by sharing, of course, in the Course in Miracles. So this goes back to Jesus and the Gospel saying, you know, the more you give, you know, the greater the abundance, the more that you have. And that is what life is about. Capital L-I-F-E. Life is really all about. Let's go on and let's start looking at, at some more of these principles. I don't know if we get all through all through today, but we'll get through some. To miracles as such does not matter. The only thing that matters is their source, which is far beyond evaluation. <clears throat> so, the miracles themselves are part of the illusory world. The reason why miracles are part of the illusory world is there are no miracles in heaven. There is no forgiveness in heaven. What a miracle is, a miracle, and we're going to see this more as we get into the Vidya Miracle Principles, a miracle is a mechanism by which we, it's a process by which we change the mind. So if it's a mechanism or it's a process by which we change the mind to see differently, once the process has been employed, you no longer need it. Once the forgiveness has occurred, there's no reason for forgiveness anymore. Because the forgiveness is, the forgiveness is a tool we need in this world in order to heal our minds. A miracle is a, is a tool that we need in this world to heal our minds. By the way, when the Course was first coming through, and they first got, when Helen was first getting, this is a Course in Miracles, <clears throat> she said, really? I mean, like, a Course in Miracles? Are you sure about this book in Miracles? <laughs> and she said, yes. It's the right word is Miracles. Because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a miracle, being the thing that changes everything. It's, a, it's miraculous in that sense, right? So, let's keep going. Miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. The real miracle is the love that inspires them. In this sense, everything that comes from love is a miracle. That's why I said earlier, I already talked about the fact that miracles are natural. And then when they don't occur, <clears throat> Something seems to have gone wrong. Well, there seems to be a lot that's gone wrong with this world because this is not really a, a, a miraculously <clears throat> loving state. 
that we're in most of the time. The good news is it's possible. <laughs> That's the good news. And it's possible to have this experience. And I think more and more people are actually kind of having this experience as time goes by. One reason why there's more interest in the course I find it's interesting that um, as there is this kind of underground interest that's growing in the course, at the same time that that's true, true, traditional Christianity is dying very, very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. I don't really realize how precipitous the death is, but it's, it's at the rate of about 1% per year on the average in, in terms of attendance in, in churches around the country. That's a very, you know, 10% in 10 years. You know, 20% in 20 years, I mean, it's just really going. And it's been doing that since the 60s, right? The reason for that is <clears throat> because the church is stuck in dogmas and rituals and creeds and rules and regulations and ritual and the same old stuff over and over again. And what as people, be, as we, as human beings, begin to wake up, we want something that's really going to, that we understand is helping us to wake us, that's really helping to wake us up, that's providing a sincere spiritual answer. That's not to say the Course is the way, or the only way, or anything like that, because the Course is very, very clear, as we said last time, it's just a way. But it's, it's a way that apparently resonates for the 50 or so uh, folks who are here this afternoon, right? And will continue to resonate. The, the course, by the way, I have to warn you, those of you who are new, it's an addiction. <laughs> now, what I mean by that is, actually, the more you do it, the more you're going to kind of want to do it. Uh, and because you'll, <clears throat> you'll begin to realize that this, is, this really is saying something that's very deep and very profound. Except sometimes, Brad and I were talking about I picked up Brad on the way down from up the west side. That sometimes when folks get like six months into the course or something, they quit. Because at that point they begin to realize that, that if you keep going deeper with this stuff, this is very threatening to the ego. The ego begins to catch on to the fact that uh, this is the course is going to end the ego. <laughs> and then it won't have a life anymore. Yippee. <laughs> That's actually where we want to get to, where that does not exist anymore. Right. So we'll keep going. All miracles mean life, and God is the giver of life. His voice will direct you very specifically. You will be told all you need to know. And I have another quote which says, Communication with God is life, <clears throat> but that this is nothing that is life. Let's talk about this a little bit longer. Um, you know the passage from the Bible where Jesus says, Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads yes. into, you know what leads into? Life. Few there are that go therein. Broad is the way, wide is the path that leads to destruction. Many there are that go therein. This is what makes the course exciting because it becomes, as you do it, as I said, you become more aware, you become more alive. You become more awake. You become more loving. You have to become more loving. It's not that you're forcing yourself to become more loving, it's just a natural thing because as you realize this is my brother or this is my sister, and why should I have any grievance against anyone at all. The Course is really helping us to, to, to stop all grievances. You'll be told very specifically what to do. I don't think I gave GPS illustration last time I was here. Did I, I no. do that? Did I do that last no. time? I don't think so. Okay, this is, this is so good. <laughs> I just love it when modern technology gives you a really good illustration. And we have a wonderful illustration from modern technology. <clears throat> so for those of you who have cars, I mean you've got GPS systems in there. And more and more, more and more people have, it's just going to be like cell phones everywhere, right? It's going to be in every car. Right? 
all, all smartphones have GPS now. Well, that's true. You know, you can uh, that's plug true. it in and walk. Right, and thought of that. Well, anybody that goes, all right, if you're smart, you've got a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> dumb phone and smartphone. <laughs> Well, it's remarkable how this thing works. Let's just talk for a moment about how this thing works. The way it works is, <clears throat> you take this little, and I think it's interesting, it's a little black box, all right? You take this little black box, and what you do is you punch in your intended destination. And instantaneously, that is at the speed of light, not sound, light. This little black box makes contact with four silver and gold angelic beings flying around this planet <laughs> at 17,000 miles per hour each, I don't understand that. They have a little conference. One of them decides on your longitude. One of them decides on your latitude. One of them picks up on your altitude. And when we're talking about GPS, this is called God's plan for salvation. And that's what it says in the Course in Miracles. GPS, God's plan for salvation. One of them picks up on your attitude. <clears throat> so, this now conveys back to you exactly the right information you need in order to get home. But there's a button on there called home, right? So you just hit home. And with it, left, right, down to the feet. How long, when you're gonna get there, exactly how you're gonna get there. It's just, well, this is the way the course works. <laughs> what this is, is this is a, a, a guidebook home. <clears throat> it's giving you directions on how to get home again. But it's also spending a lot of time telling you to how to tune your GPS system. So that you are listening very specifically to the directions that are being given to you. The problem, of course, is that we have our tuner set, using a little bit of a different illustration, on W-E-G-O. <laughs> Right. Now imagine it's a two-way radio station, right? I mean a two-way radio. So now it's, and we're 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 we spend more time listening to WEGO, and WEGO is just filled with static, you know, filled with annoying kinds of, of information that it's giving. It's not clear at all about what kind of direct. There's a lot of propaganda in there. You know, a lot of advertisers are messing around with your head. But they said this other program which is being played. And this is WGOD. This is learning how to listen to WGOD all the time. So we're just switching, we're just learning how to make this switch so that we stop listening to WEGO and we start listening to WGOD. And WGOD is very beautiful, it's very harmonic, it's very pleasing, it's very comforting. Very reassuring. You've done nothing wrong. Everything is okay. Now just do it this way. The basic problem, of course, as we have, is uh, the authority problem, which is that we say to God, "Well, thank you very much, God. I don't want to do it myself." And God says, "Fine, go ahead." But I know eventually you'll come back home again. You'll like the particle sensor. You'll get back home. And you'll start following GPS. It's inevitable. Here's a, a couple of lines I really like in the course. This one's a really very comforting line. The past as well held no mistakes. Isn't that nice? The past as well held no mistakes. So whatever those mistakes that were there in the past, you know, that was just your kind of going off course a little bit, literally. <laughs> you know, but eventually even going off course will get you back on to the right course. That's so we should be grateful for our failures. The course says that. You should be actually grateful. 
trials of the lessons presented once again, where you may the fall people's choice before you can now make a better one, and thus avoid all the pain that your previous choice has brought you. So it's just a matter of, like I said, in all decision I can just keep choose once again, choose once again. And keep coming back. And so you, you're feeling disturbed, you're feeling upset, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling annoyed, just stop. Be quiet. Listen, let them say, I want to see this, I want to see this the way you do. I want to I wanna follow your direction. Help me to follow your direction. And the direction is there. So it's just a matter of being tuned into it. Let's keep going with a few more. Five, miracles are habits and should be involuntary. They should not be under conscious control. Consciously selected miracles can be misguided. <clears throat> I want to say something about five, eight, and ten together. Ken Wapnick uses the illustration saying that when Helen was first hearing this, she wasn't entirely clear and that the illustration he uses is like if you're going to an old house and uh, the faucets haven't been turned on for a long time and you turn them on, they begin to run rusty a little bit. But then it begins to, to clear up, which is what happened with the place. These three suggest that, these three suggest that miracles are something that we do in the world. Right, five, eight, and ten. It's not really that we do something in the world. It really is that it's just a matter of what happens in terms of the change of the mind. But they're still very, very applicable. They're habits should, and should be involuntary, which means we don't really think about it. You shouldn't have to think about, excuse me, whether you want to be nice to somebody or not. It should just become an automatic, <clears throat> just what you do. It's not a thought that you have to give. You don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. You just do it. You see a need, you respond to the need. It's not should I respond to this need or shouldn't I respond to this need. It's just that you respond to the need. Going back to the preppers illustration, <clears throat> if somebody comes to your door and asks for help, what well, of course the miracles would say you should do is help them, don't kill them. <laughs> you help them, you, you do whatever you can. Because there is just one of us here. And it's only by helping each other that we're going to and find out what love really is and be able to grow out of the situations that we're in right now. So it's natural. <clears throat> and the natural thing is just to follow this straight path, this narrow line, which leads me directly home. Let's go to seven. <clears throat> Miracles are everyone's right, but purification is necessary for it. Now this is the only one, or the first one at least, <coughs> of the 50 Miracles principles <clears throat> that really talks about something that has to happen in order for miracles to occur. And this is something which happens in the mind. And, and it's called purification. I have a book that, over there that I wrote on mysticism. I used to teach courses on mysticism. And one of the things that's so wonderful about doing a course is the course in mystical te teachings uh, fit together so incredibly well with each other. Mystics have just been, simply from the past, have been people who saw the truth, the kind of idea that's expressed in the course in moments, and sometimes they were able to write pieces of it down, or they get these flashes. Right. I want to tell you about another woman uh, who I bet was a lot like uh, Helen. Her name was Evelyn Underhill. Anybody know Evelyn Underhill? All right. Well, Evelyn Underhill um, wrote the very best book that was ever written on mysticism. Uh, she was born in 1875 and died in 1941. She spent her entire life studying mysticism. She wrote 36 books on mysticism. When she died, by the way, the, the London Times said that she was a theologian above the theologians. There were no theologians. It was of her 
even though she didn't have the advanced academic degrees that the, the theologians did, right? She's spent a life studying mysticism. She wrote this wonderful book, and it's interesting when the book was published. It was published in 1911, so that's 100 years ago, right? And it's still, you can go to Barnes and Nobles or any place and buy it today. So any book is still being published and on the bookshelves 100 years after it is a classic in the field, right? So this is really a classic. So it was the textbook that I used for the classes, the university classes on mysticism. It was Evelyn Underhill's book. Evelyn Underhill said that in the course of her study, she noticed that there were five stages in spiritual growth that all the mystics seem to go through. This is not something that she just made up. She just kept seeing these stages appear. The Course in Miracles, in the beginning of the Magnificatures of the Course in Miracles, talks about six stages in spiritual development. She's got five, the Course has got six. If you split those two, that five and that six up together, they're really identical, except that uh, in one of Helen's five is, is number two and three of the sixes of, in the sixth of the Course in Miracles. At another time, if we ever get through this, we'll go maybe look at the manual for teachers, but that's, we've got to get through this first three years first. <clears throat> if you look at that process that she's describing now, the number two stage in development is always some sort of a purgation. Uh, Teresa of Avila called it purgation. So this means uh, for purification, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of these now because we want to get stay with the 50, but I'm just going to tell you about the first two stages. The first stage in spiritual development always involves some kind of an awakening within the spirit. Something begins to stir within. Something begins to disturb in a positive sort of way. Something inside you says, this isn't it. The world I see can't be real. There must be something more. Sometimes that, that happens, very often it happens with crash and burn experiences, especially with crash and burn experiences. Sometimes with crash and burn experiences, but it also can just happen for a totally opposite reason, is that you kind of succeed in the world and you get what you want materially speaking, and the home, and the kids, and the cars, and that, blah, blah, blah. and then once that's kind of done, it's like, well, this is, this can't be all that there is, there must be, there must be something more, right? You can happen because you crash and burn, it can be happen because you get what you want, but for whatever reason, it can happen, and very often it's with children, you know, just a very young child, you, and I'm sure that this is true, probably true for some of you, but there's some stirring that began to happen when you were very, very young, whether you paid attention to it or not, you know, it was telling you that it was something more, right? That's always number one. Number one is some sort of way. Number two then becomes purgation. And we mean by purgation or purification is letting go of the valueless and beginning to adapt the valuable. What's really valuable? There's a whole section in the course about distinguishing between the valueless and the valuable. And of course, the only thing that's valuable is the spiritual. Because that's the only thing that, <laughs> that's the only thing we take with us, right? We don't, you can't take anything with you. So that really doesn't matter much, whatever things you, you brought along in this journey process. So it's, it's the sh that's the beginning of that shift in consciousness as so well. So we begin, so in the first stages of the development, you may find that things are like being taken away. It may seem as though things are being taken away. It may seem as though relationships are being taken away. <clears throat> there may be appear to be losses that occur. This is actually good. <laughs> the Course actually says that. You don't realize that some of your biggest, what you think is your biggest setbacks have been your biggest advancements, spiritually speaking. And what you think of has been some of your best advancements was really some of your biggest setbacks. 
Let's say you got a lot of money. <laughs> and you didn't realize that that was actually a setback for you. It got you tied more into misperception in the material world, but then finding some sort of uh, relief and freedom from it. David? That's a question. Okay. Don't I don't mind. Go ahead. I may repeat it for them. Um, <clears throat> this principle is a little daunting for me. Okay. Because uh, according to the Course and according to the Second you know, I mean, we're filled with fear, <coughs> we're filled with guilt, loathing, a lot of real tough stuff. <clears throat> Some of which is unconscious, but some of which is right out there. And so when when they say I have to get purify myself of all of this, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a task that I can proceed along, but I'm never gonna purify myself of all of this stuff. Well, you're right and you're wrong. <clears throat> both are both are true, right? I mean Yes, of course, eventually, we'll, we'll all get the house clean. I mean, that's the only way to really get home. Is that ultimately speaking, it's all going to be cleared out. But you're also right in that, and this is one thing you have to watch out for, is of course, in America's students, that's a little bit daunting, is that the deeper you move into this material, the more you will realize that there's more cleaning to do than you thought. Than you thought. So it's, it's like you, and that's why you, you kind of engage in this purification process and you clean up. It's, it's like you kind of go down to the cellar and you clean out the cellar and you get it all kind of clean and everything. But so this is the fourth stage in the, the course of spiritual development process. And everything's looking really, really good. And then you notice that there's a, an old rug laying there on the floor. You haven't picked it and you pick it up and there's a trap door underneath and you lift up the trap door and there's some really smelly thing. <laughs> but that's good, you know, because it's just showing that you're looking deeper. You've got to go deeper and deeper. You think that you've got the, everything cleared out. And then you discover that you do have to go deeper in this process. But the good news, David, is that, and you're right, it's, it's a long process. And let's not get into any kind of arrogance and think that we've got it done. We're all students here. You know, we're all literally working our way back home again. And sometimes the work can look like it's, it's pretty heavy work. Especially, and, and sometimes it can be very surprising, but very surprising. I mean, something that will just kind of come out of the blue. And you, some dark shadow thing. You're here in an accident. You cause an accident. You know, you're responsible for, an, you know, and my God, how are you going to handle this? I mean, it's a heavy kind of a thing, or, or an illness comes to you, and then you have to deal with the illness. But it's possible to deal with this. It's possible to continue to have the faith and grow through that illness to get where you need to go. Thank you. So both of you. Let's go for a few more. We'll stop at a quarter of three, by the way. Can I add one word to that question? I think sure. what helps me in, in America or everyone's right that purification is necessary first. It's really saying, you know, we. What's, what's required of us first is the willingness to see it differently. You know, if we're stuck on our own beliefs or concepts, we can't be taught anything. So it's the willingness to look at everything differently that is, in fact, the purification. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. When we come back from the break, uh, the first thing I want, that I will say, by the way, if there are any questions, so be thinking about if there's any questions you have. Let me just do a couple more and then we'll take a break. Hey, miracles are healing because they supply a lot. Now that seems again as though something is being done, right? <clears throat> it, as though something was coming from the outside. It's not really coming from the outside. They're supplied by those who temporarily have more, meaning those who have more awareness, more understanding. By those who temporarily have less are those who simply don't, don't have the awareness yet. Which puts you in the position of being gentle and kind and loving to, to whoever it is that you need. You, you have more if, you, if you're being gentle and kind. Right? Miracles are exchange of exchange, like all expressions of love, which are always max miraculous. In the true sense, the exchange reverses the physical laws. Every more love 
to the giver and to the receiver. And that's pretty obvious one, actually. In terms of the, the more you give your love away, <clears throat> the more love you, you experience coming back your way. And that's why it's never, it's always a matter, actually, of, of giving. Giving, 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 and never ever being concerned about what you're getting. You'll, you'll get plenty as you, as you give. Plenty. You're not that about material, although that might be a part of it if you have the material worth to be able to, to do that as well. Right? Ten, the use of miracles as a spectacle to induce belief is a misunderstanding of the purpose. That again, like five, eight, and ten, as I said before, are kind of the use of the word miracle in the popular sense of the word. And in that sense, it would also be magic, and we should just say something about the power of the mind and the difference between magic and miracles. The Course is also, here's about the eighth time now, all about the power of the mind. And it's really about helping you to realize your mind is very powerful. You don't even begin to realize how incredibly powerful your mind is. And if it's directed in the right direction, you can have incredible miraculous results. You can also use your mind to manipulate the world and do things in a third. You can make a million. Yeah, make a million. If you want to use your mind to make a million, you can use your mind to make millions of dollars. As we see this sort of these success stories time and time again. That doesn't mean that you've done anything other than make a million, right? But this also would even apply to psychic kinds of things that you can do with your mind, but you don't realize your mind is very powerful. Anybody conjure up a parking space on the way here today? Yes. I got two. Do I see? I got four. I got six. God did not find that parking place for you. Don't you know? It. Okay. You created that parking place for you. Okay. This is not some divine intervention that's going on. Your mind is very powerful. You can use your mind to do all kinds of things like that, but it's your mind that's doing it. It's not, there's a part of it at least. You know. Don't think that God is intervening to do little magical tricks in your, your life. You know, that's not what's going on. That's not what it works in terms of the course. I was in Las Vegas <clears throat> driving down a major throughway and there's this big sign which says, Come see so-and-so, the great mystic. <laughs> and he's not a mystic. I mean, he could be a mystic. And be a mystic. It's the great magician was the word that the sign should have had on it, right? This is a conjurer who can do all kinds of things that look like they're mystical, but there's nothing mystical about that. This is something that's strictly, he may be playing with your mind, but it's not, it's not a, it's not a miracle. Let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at 3 o'clock on the night, okay? <laughs>